This is me, the Undead Viking. I'm taking advantage of a sunny day here in fall in Minnesota to uh, talk to you about this game right now. It is called Machina Arcana. Now, Machina Arcana is a genre of game that I really, really like, um, especially now since I've really gotten into the miniatures hobby. Machina Arcana is a people on a map type of game. It is uh, a cooperative game. Well, kind of cooperative. It can, it can twist a little bit, but I'll talk about that here probably in my final thoughts and also probably as I'm showing how the game is played. Uh, but Machine Arcana is a steampunk-themed Cthulhu game. <laughs> so, and it is uh, basically a, like, think of um, classic Cthulhu investigation of, like, things man was not meant to know. Um, it is, it is a situation where you and the, your, your cohorts are going to delve into the deeps, and, uh, along the way, they are going to go through a scenario, a chapter, a story, um, that they, the, the creators of the game have crafted, uh, that you will have to best to get to the end of the story and, and, you know, save the world, if you will. Um, it is a very deep and enriching game that, um, you know, kind of requires in a lot of ways um, multiple sessions to kind of get through. It's, it's, it's that big. Now, there are options that you can do to shorten the length if you wish, but um, I found that, like, uh, my, my group and I, um, I, I'm fortunate that I have a spot that I can leave a game open, and we were able to play through the entire, like, scenario over the course of two nights. And I, and I don't think that necessarily that would take people normally too nice to do it. It was just one of those things where we started late one night and then we came back the next day to finish. Um, but it is a situation where as the game progresses, it has things that I really, really like. Like um, you can actually see, um, one, the story kind of grow and, and tell you something. But more importantly, in my opinion, it you can kind of like feel uh, like you, your characters like toughen up. Like, like it, you know, C Cthulhu games, like has this mentality of like you are fighting something that is so much larger than yourself so much bigger than you can ever hope to like uh uh you know really overtake and and command and control that the idea of it is pure folly but um you know in the in the call of Cthulhu rpg games i played um you either go crazy or you you get really really tough and gritty and and hardened uh to to the horrors of the world and um, I, I just, I felt like that would happen. I mean, you don't, like, level up so much as, like, level up play, uh, characters, but, like, you, you get equipment, you have equipment that you actually, like, upgrade, um, you have equipment that you will, uh, like, as, as the game progresses, bigger and better equipment will present themselves to you, the monsters get tougher. The whole story kind of moves forward and, and becomes deeper and more complex and, and, and more brutal and, and more horrific as well, which is something I think that Cthulhu games tend to miss a lot. They, 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 they love the idea of like, um, you know, this, this, this great old one idea, but they don't really make the monsters really, really bizarre. They don't make the idea of it just like, like that huge, right? I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, if you go back and actually read um, uh, Lovecraft, which is tough, Lovecraft is not a real easy read. You you definitely have to uh, put your best foot forward when you're doing it. Um, but uh, you, if you if you comprehend or try to comprehend what the people are uh, experiencing, um, it isn't like horror that, uh, that 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 it isn't just tentacles coming out of water and grabbing people and and and, and eating them. It is it is something that is that is truly despicable and horrible and immensely powerful and and to put yourself into the the the, the existence of that and actually like comprehend it and actually try to make the the, 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 the horrific and terrific uh, like situation and actually like try to like implant that in somebody's head when they're playing a game is a difficult one and I think Machina Arcana pulls it off in a lot of ways but anyway um. Let me show you how the game is played. It, it, the game has a very uh, realistic, 
rule set, but that is very, I'm, I'm not going to say simple, because it isn't simple, because there's there's lots of uh, tactical decisions that you're going to make, um, but uh, there's lots of things about it that I really, really enjoy. I'll talk about those uh, in my final thoughts. But let me show you how the game is played, and then we'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts. All right, so this is Machina Arcana, and I have just gone ahead and set up the game as a four-player game, but I don't have all four-player boards out there. Um, normally, uh, you'd be playing this with three of your friends, and you would be going at this at, as a team. Now, you could play this with less people, but I will say that this game is very difficult as a co-op for lots of reasons. Um, so I would suggest that um, you do play with the four adventurers, uh, even if you have less than four people. Just double up. Uh, certain players will just control more than one character, or you could like work together and, and control that character as a team kind of thing. But anyway, so... Uh, the game, as I said, is kind of like a steampunk Cthulhu uh, investigation game. Um, the players are uh, going on like some sort of a mystery, some sort of a campaign, and they're trying to determine what's going on. Uh, you begin the game by determining what scenario you're going to play, and this is the scenario board that you see right here. Um, the scenario ha deck has several of these cards. Now, as I show you how the game is played, I'm going to show you some stuff that is going to be you know, part of the game and part of um, like the storyline. I don't want to show you too much of that um, because the, the people, and I'll show you uh, like, like the storybook and like the the, the, the monster book that they sent me with this game. And this prototype, by the way, I mean, it is a prototype, but this is top of the line. Uh, one of the better ones I've seen. But so what you're seeing in front of you, um, you know, is probably not exactly what you're going to see, but it, it's, it's going to be close. And, and I'm sure there's going to be some changes along the way. But anyway, so there is a very, very good story um, that the players are going to be going through. And um, like I said, I, I, it's kind of like a spoiler thing. I don't want to really go too far in depth with that. But um, regardless, I was only sent one scenario, uh, the scenario one, uh, and that's the one that I played through, which I've had a blast doing. But anyway, so this is the scenario. Uh, it has four different trackers on it. It has a monster threat tracker, um, and it has a monster level tracker. Um, as you know, the threat of the monster is go, goes up the track, then um, this level of the monsters that you're going to be encountering will climb as well. Um, it has a uh, both, depending upon uh, the chapter that we're on here, uh, it'll have a, uh, a monster spawn value and also a horror value. And it may be a little tough to see, but there are two trackers on either side of the card, of the cards that are here, and it tells you what those numbers will be for this chapter. So like the spawn is seven and the horror is four. And you, then you place those particular trackers. One of the cool things about this is that like you start with this um, little picture here of scenario one, the horror of the ice, and that has this like cool picture. See, so everybody can see that. This is what we're doing. And then as you complete different things, you flip it over. And so there's like the artwork in this game is amazing. But then you place it over the top like that, then you'd flip this one over. And I'll talk about how that occurs and stuff here as I talk about the gameplay. But just a cool little touch so you can kind of see um, the slow uh, descent into madness and, 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 and things man was not meant to know type of thing going on. All right, so each person will have a character. Now, I only had four characters to play with, but I only needed four. Uh, I know that like the finished version is going to have several more. Um, but you you get a character. Here's Kim Richards. Um, she is a gunman. So like there are like you know four different classes. I'll show you the other cards here in just a second. Um, it, they all have like a basic ability. In this case, if she spends two stamina, she can make a ranged attack of up to three spaces away, and she'll roll a one white die. I might as well talk about the attack dice here since I mentioned that. Um, you have white attack dice and black attack dice. The black dice are better. They're going to have more and higher results uh, than the white attack dice. And these dice are you know custom made and awesome as well. Uh, so uh, that that's and then the special ability um, when you kill, meaning that she kills, you may equip one item for one stamina. Normally, it costs more stamina to equip items, so it's just like a special ability that she has. And then you get your starting stats. She has uh, two armor and two will. If she's attacked physically, she has two armor. If she's attacked uh, or cane, you know she has uh, two armor. Um, she starts with five health and six stamina. Um, it, this, this listing here for her essence um, is five, um, but she doesn't start with any essence to begin the game. Essence is an, uh, a, a, a 
basically kind of like your arcane and uh, special ability, like your, your knowledge of the unknown type of thing. Your goal as you play this game is to gather more essence so you can do certain things. The big thing is, is that on the board, there are several different spots that you're gonna activate and you're gonna monkey with and change. Uh, and then you're going to be using your stamina for a lot of those things, but you're gonna be using your essence and you get essence by doing certain uh, events and also more almost like more importantly, you get them by killing monsters. Um, you use essence to actually push the game forward. Uh, let me grab another map tile. I don't, I don't want to pick that one up, uh, but I'll grab another map tile and I'll show you that. So these map tiles, um, they come uh, double-sided and they have different things on them. And I might as well, since I have it in front of me, I'll show you. Um, these spots right here, this little spot right here, that is like a chapter effect tile. And um, like, if you can get that lit, which is um, like kind of a special thing that can happen if you uh, are successful in certain things, it doesn't, it costs only stamina to activate it. But if you can't get it lit to activate the chapter and basically move the chapter along in the scenario, um, it costs three essence and uh, three stamina to do that. Um, stat, like essence has other abilities too. Like you can use it to, um, you know, take essence damage instead of physical damage to keep yourself alive. You know things like that. Um, there are certain spots on the board. Uh, so like these spots that you see right here, where my thumb is, uh, if you that's an event space. Um, if you can, if you activate those. Um, you will you know, get essence for doing so, and also you'll get to turn over event cards that'll, that'll assist you. That costs stamina to use. Like, all these things cost stamina. Um, over here, this is a recharge station. Um, you will go here and that will um, help you, uh, you, know, you will roll the recharge die, uh, which is this die here, and whatever you roll, like, I'll just roll it once, here, actually roll it. And so, like in this case, you would get you know, three stamina for using the recharge station. So. Uh, and also you can heal using those, so those are good. Um, you have chests. When you open up a chest, you obviously will get to gather items, and hopefully like you'll get different weapons and what have you that will able to assist you in what you're doing. Um, I don't see, do I see a workbench on here? I apologize, I don't think I see a workbench on this map tile. Oh no, right down here. So workbenches are kind of like chests as far as like getting items, but this is like you get to be more selective uh, with what you pick, so you can get bigger and uh, better stuff. Um, any place that you see that has like these grates on them, this is considered to be a trapped location. Uh, if a traps and, and these little levers that are right here and here, if those are activated, um, anything that's on those traps will uh, be attacked uh, by, by, the, by the trap itself. Um, that can affect the monsters as well. It can also affect uh, the explorers. Um, and later on, uh, character death will and can happen. And when you know, like players are killed off, they don't um, come back uh, as uh, the uh, like another adventure. Uh, they are actually turned evil, and during the monster phase, uh, they will direct the monsters and they can use the stamina that their characters had to do certain things like destroy doors so monsters can get at things and also like activate traps so you can uh, hurt explorers. Um, these spots with the Cthulhu little guy on here, uh, those are monster spawn areas. And so like, I, I, you know, this is just like one of many of the map tiles and as I said, um, they are double sided. So. Uh, you know, there definitely are things. And these are added to the board. I might as well talk about this. I apologize. I, I wanted to go through, like, the different phases. But I might as well explain how this works a little bit. So when you add a map board, you will look on the, 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 the board, and you'll look for this symbol right here, right there. And that means that that is the top of the board. And so then you will add it um, to, you know, different spots on the board where you've explored it. Now normally you don't know where these spots are because you have to like travel off the board and actually like getting to an edge where you will then explore the edge of the board and then you know step through and go to the next area that is like uh, that costs stamina to explore it and actually then to, to move through and so when you add them you just as you probably guessed you just add them onto the table. The most you can ever have on the table is going to be a two by two square. 
if you want to exit the board and leave, so let, you know, I, I'm going to cheat a little bit just so you can kind of see this. So I'm just going to put this down. Normally this wouldn't work because that needs to be up like that. But let me grab another map tile. All right, so here is another map tile. And I should mention, you get a stack of these and you're always drawing them off the bottom so you don't know what's the one thing. And you shuffle them up and you turn them upside down and stuff. So you pull it out of, off the bottom of, of, the, of the stack and then you'll have this as your map tile. So that if the explorers left to go over here, one, you would add the, uh, add the map tile like this and then this map tile, you just get rid of it and you shuffle everything over. If there are explorers, on that map tile, um, you can't do that. Uh, and this works, you know, th like I said, the most you're gonna have is a four, as a two by two square. You can't have like weird ge geometric shapes or anything like that. Um, if monsters are on the board that you would, they are considered to be banished, not killed, but banished, and and then you they they're, they're taken off. So um, just you know, keep that in mind that like it's kind of like a scrolling effect. Uh, when it comes to the map tiles that are being placed. But anyway, let me grab this one and pull it off. So uh, that's how uh, the game represents like you, uh, you know, investigating further and spelunking further into what's going on. All right, so let's actually like look at um, the scenario card that we started off with. So I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I mean, you have like, this is, like I said, it's very well written. It's a very good story that's being told here. So it's like the entrance. Um, As we stepped into the dark, an uncanny gust of wind followed us in, continuing on through the wide and spacious halls, echoing incessantly. Our eyes, still blinking from the polar glare, adapted at last and we could see our surroundings. And so one person will read this aloud get everybody in the mood and get everybody excited to do battle with the great old ones and, and try to, you know, stop the destruction of our world. And then what happens is, is you are going to go directly into um, the explorer phase. Now, the explorers don't have a set order they will go in. Uh, the players will discuss and decide, you know, what they want to do and how they want to do it. Um, during the explorer phase, you will just use your stamina to take different actions and move about the board, and this could be, you know, any one of many things. The big thing is, is that th there's four phases. There's the explorer phase, there's the spawn phase, there's the horror phase, and then there's the monster phase. And so you need to be cognizant of what is going to happen. I should also mention, I, I, when I was showing you the map tiles, I didn't talk about this. These black spots those are pits. Um, that is not just like you can't go here. Like you can actually use those to kill monsters and you should actually watch out yourself if you're if you're the explorers as well. You will use those. You can. There's different effects that allow you to pull monsters or push monsters away and if you can get them to land in those pits you will actually be able to destroy them. All right. Um, so different actions like we have here. Um, like if Kim Richards is going to go. I have five stamina. Moving one spot costs one stamina. Now, there's no movement points in this game. There's not like, oh, you know, like, it's just you have five stamina and you can move. And knowing that, you also have to think about like other things that you want to do. Like maybe she wants to get to a chest and if she can get to a chest, then, you know, she'd be able to use her stamina to, to open that chest. Not a, not a bad idea or whatever. And so, um, you know, is there, you know, are you going to try to, you know, get to different event spaces? You know, this is, these are all discussions that you're going to have with the different players. And a lot of times it'll be like, you go and you go over there to open that door. So then I'll be able to move to that, past the door, and I'll be able to then go to that event space and, and so on and so forth. So the different things that you can do. Um, the big thing is, is that you and the other players need to be communicating and need to be talking and need to come up with what you think the best possible aspects are going to be. Now, in a lot of cases, like, you know, you have, um, like, you, she's going to be really good at fighting. Uh, there's, there's a, oh, I forgot to tell you, I was going to show you the other uh, player cards. Here, hold on a second here. So these are the other ones that I have. And, like, here is um, Hank Horton. He's a bruiser, so obviously he's, like, the big, like, guy that's going to, you know, be good at fighting hand-to-hand, -hand. Um, you know, as you probably would have guessed. Uh, here we have um, the crafter. Uh, you know, he's going to be more of an arcane guy, and you know, also like he's going to be more of a like a weapons person, like a you know, going to be looking for 
bigger and better equipment as the game progresses. And and then we have, you know, the Mystic, as you can probably guess. Uh, the Mystic is going to not only be your spellcaster, but also look like you can restore one health to any explorer by spending an essence to do so. So it's going to be your healer as well. And each one of these, I should mention, has a little backstory. And it's always a good idea to read that aloud so everybody can kind of get an idea of your character. And it always just helps in games like this with, where you're doing, like, you know, quasi role playing, um, you know, and, and living out the life of your character on the board. But anyway, so um, just remember, it costs uh, stamina to pretty much do anything that you want to do on the board. Um, so uh, you're going to move about and you're going to attempt to, you know, your big thing is, is that you want to get essence or you want to act, get this lit and you have these tokens here that look like this. And then, like, if you can get it lit, uh, then it's easier to activate. And then you want to activate it so you can, you know, make it look like it's been done and it's been uh, succeeded. And because as soon as you do that, you can move on to the next chapter of the of the board of the game. All right. So movement can be diagonal. Uh, and it, it, it's just basically any of the adjacent spaces you can move to, you can move to. Also, uh, you can move diagonally through corners. This isn't a game where, you know, if my character here, if I wanted to move diagonally here, I don't have to go the long way around. One space, and I'd be able to do that. Um, and I just get to that spot. Um, the, the big thing is, is that uh, you can't move through monsters, um, and you can't end up in the same space as anybody else. So you have to make sure you plot your movement well. So um, if I wanted to, you know, say get to this barrel, and I'm going to cheat and say I was here. I can go one, two, and I can get to that uh, chest. And then using my remaining uh, stamina, I can go ahead and use my three stamina left because I have five. Uh, I will go ahead and open uh, that chest. And then that activates an effect. It's called the gain item effect. I should mention that the rule book that I was sent um, is really well made, and they they um, they reference uh, like different pages, and they reference like oh go to this page, and this is the effect that it, it, it enacts, and just a really well done uh, process that they have. But when you resolve the gain item effect, uh, you if you if you're going activating a chest for one, you get to restore an essence because like you're exploring, it's rewarding you for doing something. So you're going to go ahead and push your essence up one for doing so. And then you draw the top card from a single item of the deck of your choice. Now you can see there are four decks over there. Uh, the top one there with the hand, um, that is going to be your weapons deck. Um, it's going to be, it's the deck that has the most cards in it. And it also uh, like has obviously going to be the items that you're going to need if you're going to have any shot at killing uh, the, the, the horrible uh, monsters that from the other worlds uh, that are trying to come here and destroy ours. Um, the one below that one is the consumables. Those are items that you just get to use and they're going to give you an effect. Uh, the one below that with a little person on it uh, is the apparel. Uh, that's going to be armor and different things that you can wear that help you. And the bottom one is going to be artifacts, which are kind of like a catch-all. Um, I'll show you some sample cards from that here, from all those decks here in just a little bit. But, um, so if we do the gain item effect, we get to take one from any of the, any of the decks that we wish, you know, you, and so you can like decide, you know, what do what I need? Do I need like a consumable right now? Do I need, you know, something that's going to be assisting me? Uh, you, you can make your mind. But then according to the um, rules, then you draw another top card um, from the deck based upon your class. So if you are a bruiser, you will get a weapon. If you're the gunman, you're going to get a peril. If you're a crafter, you get a consumable. And a mystic, you get an artifact. From those two cards, you pick one, and then you give it, you, you then you keep it, or you can give it to another explorer. So if you grabbed it and this person was right next to you, and you're like, oh wow, this would be a really good thing for you, you can hand it off immediately. Normally you have to spend stamina to do that. Uh, then you can destroy the other card, or you can put it back on top of the corresponding item deck. Um, you know, and then if you, because it's a chest, you'll then put an explored item token on it, just so people know that you can't get it. So let's go ahead and activate that chest, and we'll see what we get. So let's go ahead, and since I'm going to get apparel, let's just take the top apparel card, put that aside like this, and let's take the top weapon and see what we get. 
because I like weapons. All right, so let's see what we got here. Oh, and I should mention that uh, items are have levels to them, and so you can see that there are these are level ones. Uh, these are the only cards that I that, that you can get until uh, the scenario actually tells you to incorporate the level two items and then the level three. Um, so, uh, so you, you're either going to put those at the bottom of the decks, like I have in these, in this case, or um, just set them aside. Uh, so, you know, we have these, so let's see, the Fuzzamata, uh, when you're hit, the attacker loses one stamina, so that's obviously when you're attacked, then uh, the monster that attacks you loses a stamina, so that maybe it won't be able to, you know, keep moving, or it won't be able to attack you again, uh, not, not bad, um, you know, not great, but not bad, and then here we have the Rogue Rifle, um, oh wow, this is really good, this is perfect for my character, um, so it costs three stamina to use, it has a range of four, you can see that it's listed right there, um, and then I get to roll three of the top hit attack dice, and then it says when you kill, look at the top two cards from one item deck and reorder or destroy any of them. So, that, I mean, that's, that's great, because basically we can cycle through stuff we don't want, and whatever. Now, I do want to mention a couple of things. You might notice that, like, there are these little, like, connections here and stuff like that. These allow you to up grade equipment. And I'll show you an example of this a little bit later. But later on when you get stuff, um, you can you'll be able to attach different um, items onto different things. Like maybe like you can get an attachment that will make um, your rogue rifle uh, do arcane damage or something like that. So you can attack the will instead of the body of monsters. Things like that. Plus you can see the weapon here has two hands. So like you wouldn't be able to use a weapon in each hand because this the rogue rifle would take both. But you, you get an item, you're gonna put it right there. Now, if I had gotten an item that maybe I thought the Mystic could use, maybe I could hand it off to her, which I'm not going to do. But, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna decide that we're going to put that back on top of the deck. We're not going to destroy it. We're going to put that back up there. Maybe somebody will want that next time, and they'll have the option to do so. Now, the difference between using uh, a chest and being able to use a uh, workbench um, when you activate that to gain items... Um, when you use a workbench, you draw the top three items from any of the item decks. You can choose the same item deck multiple times, but you just pick any three. You can swap any of the drawn cards with the items from your inventory, so you can equip or unequip them. I should also mention, yes, this isn't considered equipped until my next turn. I'll have to spend stamina to equip it. And that's how you equip it, and you will add, um, like, any, if, you, if you have any additions to it or anything like that, you do that. So, And then you choose one card and then keep it or give it to an adjacent destroyer, and then destroy any number of remaining cards, and then place the rest on top of your corresponding index in any order. So you can, uh, using a workbench is like obviously fantastic and so much better than normal, but um, you you definitely uh, like, you know, they're, they're, they're not as numerous as chests, but if you can get to them uh, and use them, very, very important and very, very cool if you do. All right, so um, there's, there's so many different things you can do, and I, I don't want to walk through like an entire turn with you, but so let me just kind of um, walk through some of the other things, the other options uh, that you have. The big thing for me right now that I want to show you is using an event space. So um, if you have the players, like you, somebody goes over here and, and opens the door, and when you open a door, you then can take like one of these um, items, like little like uh, tokens, and you place that on the board that show that the door is open. Um, the, the back of it actually shows that like the whole thing's been destroyed. Um, doors can get destroyed. So, um, you know, that's something that happens. Also, I should mention that one of the very common things you'll end up trying to do is you'll end up trying to like possibly destroy the spawn spaces as well. Uh, for monsters, uh, and that's something that you know it, it costs a lot of essence and stamina, but it's something you'll do. Um, but um, so, like, if you open the door, maybe somebody else comes up from behind and then you know follows through and then goes over here to use uh, one of the spaces that is going to allow you to uh, use the events. Uh, events cost three stamina uh, when you do them. But the big thing is you get to draw one of your event cards. Now, there's two different types of event cards. Um, there are the Explorer event cards, and there are the Horror event cards. As you can probably guess, the Explorer <laughs> event cards um, are slightly better uh, than the other. When you use uh, the event spot, uh, you will you will gain, uh, this isn't that character, but you'll gain an essence for doing so. And then you just draw the top card off the deck, and then you're going to read what it says. And so here it says, um, a moment's rest. Uh, and then it says, uh, although this place is under the illusions of eternal nightfall, 
we need uh, to embrace a daily routine. We make camp, feasts, and sometimes we imagine a few precious moments of slumber, all of which serve to calm our restless souls. These times prove more valuable than any of us ever imagined. Our refreshed bodies and soothed minds march onward with a determination that never felt as strong. Explorers activate chests and event spaces for one less stamina. So um, here you have, you know, just an effect that is going to make, you know, if, if we'd had that before, but maybe if you do that prior, then other people can like, oh, now I can make it to that chest and I can, I can open it up and I can, I can use it. So it's definitely one of those things where uh, you then, you know, everybody gets affected uh, by these uh, when you activate them. All right. So, uh, like I said, I wasn't going to go through every single possibility of the things that you're going to be doing uh, on your turn, but mostly on your turn, what you're going to do, as long as there's no monsters, because we haven't done the spawn monster phase, um, what you're going to be doing is you're going to move, explore the, the, the tile you're on, possibly go to the edge if you feel like you've done all the exploring you can, and using stamina to, you know, explore and then move off to the other side, and, you know, everybody takes their turn. If they decide not to do anything, you can just stop doing whatever you're doing. You don't have to use all your stamina, but you know, you'll recharge your stamina at the beginning of the next turn. All right, so now you go into the spawn phase. Now, each person is going to, so you're, what, during the spawn monster, you are going to uh, check to see if you are going to you know, spawn monsters in the spawn spaces that are located. So, for starters, if there are four or more monsters on the board, you don't spawn anything. You just increase the monster threat, uh, and you know because you have to kill monsters for more monsters. You can't just glut a map space, uh, you know, and, and the map with with the monsters. Uh, so what what you're going to do though before you check for that is that each person is going to roll the this ten sided die, and when you roll this die. Uh, you are going to see if this roll is equal to or greater than the current spawn rating indicated on the chapter board. And that, that spawn rating right now is seven. So each person is going to roll the die. So let me see what I get here. I got a five, I got a six, I got a nine, so that means one person, and I got a four. All right, so uh, there are some things that happen when you're rolling those that dice though. If the roll is equal to or greater than the current spawn rating indicated on the chapter board, um, then you're going to spawn a monster, and then you reset the spawn rating to the 7. If the roll is less than the current spawn rating, you lower the spawn rating by 1. So, I, I probably, I think, I think the second roll was 6, I apologize. So, like, it would have gone like this. It would have gone 7 to 6, and then we would have spawned a monster because I rolled 6, and then we would have gone back up to 7. Then we rolled that 9, and so we would have spawned again, and then we would have rolled that 4, and we'd go down one again. So in this case, we would have two monsters spawn. So let's just say it was my gunman and the bruiser that, act, that, that, that did the spawn. So when you spawn a monster, what you'll do then is you draw the top card from the monster deck over here. And like in this case, we have a Mego, and I'll talk more. I'll show you this card again here in a little bit. And then we draw another one for the other spawn, and this is a Saral. And so these monsters have different stats, and I'll show them to you here, as I said, in just a second. But uh, more importantly, they have uh, the tokens that represent them. Uh, so the Mego, uh, let's just, so we'll put that on that spawn space, and we'll put the Saral, if I can find the, the token for it, and we'll put that one there. So... Uh, after we've spawned those monsters, then we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, move on to the next phase, which is going to be the horror phase. Now, so at the start of the horror phase, um, you're going to roll this game die. And the horror uh, effect of this particular, uh, like, board, this chapter, is four. And so we're going to roll this die, and if it's equal to or greater than the horror value, then we're going to invoke a horror event. If not, we're going to, it's less, we're going to lower the horror rating by one. Kind of like the spawn monsters, but this is more of a global effect. So we'll roll this. We rolled a five, so we're going to do a horror event. Let's drop, draw the first horror card, see what happens. Uh, vicious attack. So how is it possible that this forsaken place could be even darker? An odd gloom has settled thicker and deeper than before. If only this had been the full extent of the misfortune, but no, the savage beasts were empowered by it, 
and their bloodthirst and their furor only grew greater, and we felt more defenseless than ever. Um, great, great, uh, great text, but the, the increased monsters attack roll by one. And I'd just like to say, don't just go, ah, oh, we increased monsters attack roll by one. Read them out loud, enjoy the game, have fun with it, and, and go crazy. So, um, when monsters uh, then go, you're going to play them in the queue that they've arrived. And so you're going to have, like, this one's first and that one. So you're going to go in that order. Um, then uh, what you'll do is you will, uh, you know, move, uh, like, you'll, you'll move them towards the different, uh, uh, like, they, they, unless they're being controlled by a character, a player that's lost their character, they will just move towards the uh, the closest like uh, pr person next to them. There are a few things that will uh, help determine that as though. Um, the only target move towards the nearest explorer, uh, and then just to count the number of steps it takes to get to that explorer, um, they will, uh, if, if they have multiple choices of who they want to go after, they will go after the one with the lowest remaining health. And also, then, uh, if that is equal, then whoever is the easiest to hit uh, based on the monster's attack and the explorer's attribute that they're targeting. And then just if that's still equal, then the player is determined as well. So obviously the Mego is going to uh, want to attack... Uh, the gunman. And luckily both of these don't have ranged attack. So just quickly you can see like the Migo has like a three for their for their body, a four for their will, they have two health, uh, they have five stamina. And it costs two stamina to do their arcane attack of three dice. And but when this monster dies, its attacker invokes an explore event, which is pretty cool. And of course there's some flavor text as as you'd expect. Let's just look at the Saral real quick as well. And so here we have this one, his body of three, a little less than the mine thing, two health as well, four stamina, so it's not as quick, and but it has this fairly massive attack. Uh, three stamina to attack two and two. And when it dies, it attacks uh, adjacent units with an attack of three. So uh, the Sorrel is going to be easy because it's not going to get close enough. We're going to go one, two, three, four. And here we have a situation where if next turn, somebody could go here and activate, um, if they could get to activate the, the, the trap, the Sorrel would get attacked and none of the explorers are actually on that. So that's one of those things that you're going to be working together to figure out. Now the Migo has a five, and I don't think... Well, it's actually going to be able to attack. So it's going to go one, two, three. It has two left, and it's going to make an arcane attack using these three dice. Now, my defense uh, for the gunman is a two. So what, what they're going to try to roll here is they're going to try to either meet or exceed that number by rolling these dice. I'm going to guess it's going to work, but we'll see what happens. And so, yes, easily it got a total of four. There's a blank right there. Um, the good thing is, <laughs> well, and it could be a bad thing too if you're the one attacking, um, you only do one point of damage, regardless to anything. So, you know, we, we, we drop that down by one when you take the damage. Now, when you hit zero, you're dead. Uh, there's no like, oh, you're lingering or anything like that. Uh, you, you, do, you do die. But thankfully, I'm close to the mystic, and, you know, the mystic, you know, theoretically uh, will want to, you know, try to help me out, if, if you will. Um, so... Combat resolves really, really quickly. Now, later on, there's some monsters that are um, you know, higher level that have more complex things that happen. But for the most part, like combat, you're not like dicing off or anything like that. You're just rolling dice against somebody else rolling dice. And then you're going to, you know, determine the, the, the win. Uh, who, who wins uh, by, you know, just a simple addition and comparison. Um, you know, attacking the monsters works exactly the same way. Uh, remember, this gun has attack of three heavy. So, like, if I am shooting that that one, I would roll. Uh, the defense for the body is three for the Migo. I would, you know, I'd have two. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd hit it, and I'd be doing So that would be, like, one point of damage. The Migos have two hits, so I'd have to, you know, me and another player would have to work together. Or I could hope to do that attack, which was, you know, three stamina, to do that one, and then do my basic attack, which takes two stamina, and, you know, hope I, if I rolled, I don't even think I could. No, because I, I, it has a three health, because these uh, these white dice do not have a three on them. Uh, the, the black dice do, however, they have a three. So if I had that and I got lucky and I rolled a three, 
I would kill the Vigo, and you know we do the two points of damage to it. We'd remove it from the board, and I would gain essence uh, for doing so. And because it says you know you, you get an explore event, we'd roll and we'd see here where we'd have um, uh, in all ness. In all necessary things and actions, there is always a catch, a secret idea, a passageway, a word that can sometimes prove worth more than a thousand striders. The cult, our voyage to the unknown, the monsters we face, they all form a rich tapestry, and so our efforts and the goals and the enemies are intertwined, a tiny drama within an infinite cosmic theater. Uh, sacrifice one essence, uh, three of them, like so, so three times, and then you get to light the chapter, which is a huge thing. So if you, you're able to light the chapter, then you're actually able to place one of these items on that location, the meaning it only takes one stamina to go ahead and activate that location, and then uh, you were able to then to move on to the next thing. So if that was the case, we would, you know, if somebody did that on their turn, they would do that and then we would turn this over and then we go the trail of blood and so now we have the sacrifice one health to move to three spaces um if you know four people sacrifice one help uh you know go to the next chapter so there's like awesome little things we'd have a a six on uh the 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 spawn and a four on the horror and so and another storyline there and i'm not gonna like i said not gonna go fully into like the storyline of the, of the scenario because I want you to be able to explore that yourself. Um, but I mean, the only other difference is, is that if one of the players dies, then um, you have what's called scheming monsters, which uh, the players that are dead will work together to try to, you know, take out the people that are still alive. And uh, the big thing there is that they will use their stamina they have to open or close doors. Uh, for three stamina, they can open or close them. Um, they can destroy uh, doors for four stamina, or they can activate a trap lever for three trap lever for three stamina. And then they also do all the rolls and everything uh, for and for the monsters. No, no, they're not on the board anymore. They're just kind of like this hive mind, like kind of controlling what's going on. Um, you know, there's. Obviously, this is a people on a map game, and I love people on a map games, and I've played tons of these. What, what makes people on a map games successful for me are, do you immerse me in the story, and do you make me want to play it by giving me um, fairly simple but tactical rules that will allow me to like kind of enrich myself in the narrative? And this game does that. Um, it probably helps that it combines a couple of things that, that I, I tend to be intrigued by. Um, I am obviously a huge Cthulhu person, but um, you know, steampunk has always been kind of on my radar. But I'll talk about more about that and also just more of the narrative stuff that goes on with this game uh, in my final thoughts. Jeez, <laughs> that was a fail. Okay, there we go. Uh, Machina Arcana. All right, so I, I, I mentioned a few things in my introduction. I mentioned a few things while I was teaching how, how the game is played. A um, uh, couple things I wanted to specify before I forget them. Um, I talked about the like uh, ability that, that certain uh, weapons and whatever have the ability to be upgraded. Um, that uh, and, and I wanted to, like... I, I forgot to actually like truly you know delve into that and for that I do apologize um, but uh, that's part of like a huge part of, of the game as far as like the, the level of process that I was talking about the the the, the like you, where you can see uh, your characters you know getting better you can see the things like you know improving you can see them uh, you know finding themselves, like, maybe even with an advantage uh, when they're dealing uh, with these threats. Um, I mentioned I wanted to show you some of the cards. Uh, so there are, like, all these, like, you know, there's, there's simple things, like, and you probably can't see this, but this is, like, basically a medical kit. Um, you can use certain abilities with it, and the, you get rid of it, and you restore three health, restore six stamina, restore two essence, um, like this energizing pulse, uh, like reduces two health. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, restores two health to the uh, to to the, the explorers, but then reduces the max stamina of monsters by two. Um, these 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 one shot consumables are, in a lot of ways, in integral in into actually pulling off wins and being able to, uh, like you know, succeed. 
Um, if you if you decide that you'd rather have like equipment and, and you think that those aren't going to be for you, um, you are going to find yourself um, like definitely behind the eight ball, and you're not going to have a lot of uh, luck uh, when it comes to uh, you know dealing with um, the the horrible things that that you have to uh, defeat. You know, health and healing uh, doesn't come easy in this game. Uh, you you definitely need to to plan ahead and. Um, whereas the actual combat will, uh, the actual combat, like, is seemingly not so deadly because that's only, like, one point of damage, that stuff starts stacking up and it starts stacking up, and if you don't, like, have, like, kind of, like, band-aids going on on a fairly regular basis, all of a sudden you're going to end up with multiple explorers with two or one health, uh, and you don't really have any real good way uh, to get them back up and running, and, and you're running the risk of, you know, the cascading loss. Now, I didn't talk about actually winning or losing the game. Obviously, to win the game, you have to get through all the chapters and then go through an end game scenario. There's like a big last final thing. I'm not going to go into that because, like I said, I want you to experience the game um, yourself. But it is a very satisfying end to a very like to to a lot of chapters that that, that the game puts you through, and I and I really appreciate that about it. Also, each scenario has its own specific events that you actually put into the, the, the event decks um, that are very thematic to the story and make sense. And those are kind of neat when you run into those as well. It's just another added thing that makes the makes it like that much more cool, you know, as far as um, like the, the process and the thought that went into the creation of this game. Uh, I mentioned the rule set. Um, it's it's. Like I said, once you understand your turn, once you understand like these are the this is the amount of stamina, this is the amount of actions I'm going to get this turn, unless you have different uh, abilities and recharges and things like that you can use to re you know get yourself back up. Um, you definitely have situations where uh, it's it's very deterministic, but you're not running into a lot of situations where there's a lot of randomness. Yes, attacks are random, and I do appreciate that. I think, like, combat should always be, um, you know, very, very, you know, have a random element to it, you know, and because of the fact that, you know, combat is random. But uh, I, I did um, like the fact that it wasn't one of those things where, you know, oh, you want to uh, open this chest? Well, let's see if you get it open. You know, oh, you wanted to... Uh, you know, like use this this workspace. Let's see if you actually pull it off. You want to get this event? Let's see if you if you find it. I, I liked the fact that for the most part your actions were very very determined and very very just like you plotted it out and you were able to do it. And you know, for that point, I, I like games that are tactically sound and, and Machine Arcana is. Now, um, above all else, like all the other things that I said, I, I, I mentioned the storyline of the game and in the presentation. First of all, the art Top-notch, fantastic, beautiful. Um, the art alone, I wish, like, for some of the stuff that, that's in here, I wish I had art prints for it, you know, because <laughs> I would definitely put them on my uh, on my uh, uh, my board game room wall. Um, there are a couple extra books that I got sent. Um, one is this storybook, and one is this Bestarium. Um, I want to talk about the Bestarium really quick because of the fact that there are, um, like, all these pictures in here of the different things that you're going to be fighting and kind of like gives you explanations to them and stuff like that but i want to say that like whereas like you have things like the night gaunt that actually kind of look like something you'd find in like a, a monster manual um you have things you know like the gug you know which don't really look like anything i mean maybe you know weird way um it kind of looks like a stranger things monster if you look at gug um but um you have things like the elder thing or the Upog, and you have these things, and this is Call of Cthulhu to me. Call of Cthulhu is not a bunch of deep ones, whereas deep ones are not a bad thing to have in a game, or they're, they're, they're kind of neat and everything like that. But these are things that I like. This is like the formless, like, what is that? The, the, the color from outer space type of thing, um, you know, that, that just like, oh, it's just a bunch of weird teeth and 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 slime and and like oh god i don't even get close to that type that thing um so i really like the fact that they include this it just adds to the um the, the like how cool the thing is now here you have this storybook and the storybook is exactly that it is a storybook it is a thing with chapters that you're going to read and it's going to give you a wonderful background into the uh 
the, the world. It's also going to have um, pictures and stories about the different uh, the different people that are going to be you know uh, the explorers that you're going to be running. And I and I I appreciated those things as well. You know, just because here read a little bit more about your character and and understand it. So. Um, I, they went through a lot of writing and they went through a lot of uh, process to make a narrative and make a, a story and if you want to take the time to enrich yourself in that I think you're going to be rewarded even more than you are just by playing this game and so I kind of appreciate when uh, game companies go through that process to um, you know, make uh, the games more like a game but in, in a weird way a piece of literature and a piece of art as well so uh, bottom line if, we, if we're just going to all druthers aside, I really enjoyed the game. I really had a lot of fun with it. My daughter really had fun with it. Um, my gamer group really had fun with it. We just enjoyed going through the story and kind of seeing how it progressed. Um, it is, as I said, if you don't have a good rule set, games like this can fall apart. Um, this one does not fall apart. It is it is very, very good at, and, and, and it like it takes a little as with any game it takes like that one or two turns to kind of understand the different things that you can do how you affect those um what you need to do but once you figure that out and you have this tactical rule set that is very very straightforward and very very intuitive as well uh you can relax and enjoy the story that the game's trying to tell you you can start seeing the pictures in your head of the things that are going on on the board and you can start having fun and having heroic moments that like are kind of the reason why you play games like this um you know ultimately art is fantastic presentation is fantastic um, mechanics and of the game fantastic and it's just flat out fun um i'm kind of a tweener when it comes to steampunk you know as far as i i, I can kind of see where it looks cool and it's kind of neat uh you know, uh, I, I can, I, I'm not going to say I love it, I'm not going to say I hate it, but in this instance, it works really, really well in combination with the Cthulhu Mythos that they're using. Um, if you are a fan of cooperative games and if you're a fan of cooperative tactical games, uh, and if you're a Cthulhu fan or a steampunk fan, I mean, if, if you can say yes to any of those things, I think you're really, really going to like this one. And I strongly suggest uh, that you take a closer look at Machina Arcana. So uh, there you go. If you have any questions about it, please ask away. I'll be happy to answer those as best as I can. As always, thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video. Until next time, this is me, the Undead Viking, telling you to be the most awesome you you possibly can be. Stay positive, stay motivated, and, uh, you know, Cut the, cut the negativity out of your life and, 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 and try to be the person that other people want to be around. All right, until next time, this is me. That's you. Have an awesome day.